It's a joy to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Camden Busey. I serve as a Executive Director of Reformed Forum. I'm also very pleased to serve as a, as a board member here at Mid-America Reformed Seminary. And I want to welcome you this evening and also issue a very uh, warm and heartfelt thank you uh, to the seminary community and particularly the faculty for allowing us to be here this evening and for hosting us and for your uh, wonderful hospitality. It's a joy to be here this evening and to hear about the Trinity as we welcome Dr. Lane Tipton to lecture on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology, asking uh, kind of what has become an age-old question, whether it's Reformed or Revisionist. So we, we hope to hear about that this evening, and, and hopefully it will provoke many questions in your minds and in your hearts. But why don't we begin uh, this evening uh, with uh, us, uh, a hymn. We'll sing hymn number 230 in the Trinity Psalter hymnal. If you have one, uh, we can pass them out if you don't have one yet. Number 230, holy, 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 number 230. Let us pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening that we may gather here at the seminary to hear about you and to learn about you. We pray, Lord, that uh, the lectures would be edifying unto your church. We thank you that you have revealed yourself unto us as the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one essence in three persons. And we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased with our time this evening, with our conversation, even with the meditations of our minds and our hearts. We ask that you would bless us and that you would bless your church around the world, for we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you please be seated. Again, I want to thank uh, the seminary community here and for all those who are watching online on YouTube. We want to welcome you as well. Uh, for those of you uh, who may not know much about the seminary community here, if you're watching online, we are at Mid-America Reformed Seminary, which is just in Dyer, Indiana. Isn't it so strange that you're all here and I'm telling you about where you are? But the people online, uh, we, uh, we, it is, uh, I get here on exit one. It's right across the border from Illinois in uh, Indiana in this lovely area which indeed is uh, the homeland, uh, not the home homeland, but at least the American homeland of none other than Cornelius Van Til, who grew up just a few minutes from here in Dyer. He grew up in, in Highland, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that is who we are going to be talking about and hearing about tonight. And so for those of you who know Reform Forum and have been following what we do, you will be no stranger to Dr. Lane Tipton, who serves as the pastor of Trinity Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Easton, Pennsylvania, as well as a fellow of Biblical and Systematic Theology at Reformed Forum. And we're pleased to have him this evening to deliver two lectures, again, on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology, Reformed or Revisionist. If you'd like to follow up on this, you can, you can find out several new online courses that we have for free online at reformedforum.org. We just recorded one this week. Uh, the seminary is very kind to open up a classroom for us to record that, and that hopefully will be online, Lord willing, uh, by the end of the year. But let us uh, welcome Dr. Lane Tipton as he delivers our lectures. Well, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be with you tonight. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to the uh, faculty for allowing this to happen, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about the Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til. Uh, it's a topic that has been, over the past several years, uh, resurgent in certain ways. There has been renewed interest in the theology of Van Til. There have been some published works that have engaged critically with his theology. And so I think it's an appropriate time for us to spend some time looking at Van Til's Doctrine of the Trinity and ask the question whether it is reformed or revisionist. And my lecture is very straightforward tonight. It's important as we begin to study and think about Van Til's Trinitarian theology to ask the question, is it reformed or is it revisionist in character? Is it faithful to the confessional tradition that Van Til upheld or does it depart from it in meaningful ways due to influences that are philosophical or theological that would push him outside of that Reformed tradition. And it's important as we begin to approach Van Til's uh, theology that we do our best to let Van Til speak for himself through the primary sources and in light of his published corpus. It's important for us to be as 
open to Van Til's system as it's presented in his work as we can be. And this is so for at least two reasons. First, misunderstandings of Van Til abound. Whether it's the work of the De Boers and others in the 1950s, John Vanderstelt in the 1970s, R.C. Sproul and John Gershner in the 80s and 90s, or John Fesco and Keith Matheson in the past few years. These misunderstandings rest in large part on a lack of careful exposition and sympathetic understanding of Van Til's published corpus. And as Christian scholars, we need to do our best to understand any theologian on his own terms and in light of the primary sources that best express his thinking on a given topic. And this leads me to a second point closely related to the first. We need to understand Van Til's Trinitarian formulae in light of a careful and patient examination of his published corpus and against the backdrop of the primary influences upon him and the theological concerns that he faced. This means that we need to be guided to a proper understanding of Van Til through a sympathetic and critical engagement of his primary works. By sympathetic, I mean that we should try to understand Van Til's own language and own theological formulae in the way he intended it to be understood. By critical, I mean we should be willing, where necessary, to subject Van Til to criticism and refinement. Certainly all of us can speak with greater dogmatic precision and fidelity. Van Til is no exception. Thus, we should not have an a priori uh, blindly to defend Van Til simply because Van Til said it, nor should we have an a priori blindly to accuse Van Til of error just because Van Til said it. We should, in short, not engage in a wholesale rejection of Van Til on the one side, nor in idealized hagiography of Van Til on the other side. We need sincere engagement, careful analysis, and scholarly assessment of his Trinitarian theology in order to be in a position where we can evaluate it, assess it, appreciate it, and apply it in ways that are fruitful and faithful. So the topic for this mini lecture series, these two lectures this evening, is Van Til's Trinitarian theology. I cannot come close to saying everything that needs to be said on this topic, so I have to be selective, and I have to narrow the topic down to the question that Dr. Busey raised at the beginning, is Van Til a revisionist or is Van Til reformed? I hope that's an interesting enough question to raise to keep your attention as we work through this. Now, the most extensive and intensive discussion of the doctrine of the Trinity in Van Til's writings is found in chapter 17 of an introduction to systematic theology. In that section, you find the fundamental structural strands of Van Til's Trinitarian theology. So let us look for some time at that chapter and seek to understand the influences behind Van Til's Trinitarian theology so that we can be in a position to assess whether it is, in fact, an expression of confessionally reformed Trinitarian theology or if it has departed from those paths under the influence of philosophy, idealist or otherwise. And the focus of our discussion then is going to be at first on chapter 17 of IST. If you're looking for the foundational dogmatic expression of Van Til's Trinitarian theology, the best place to begin according to Van Til himself is the Westminster Confession of Faith, particularly as expounded by A. A. Hodge in his commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Having cited several standard passages of Scripture from the Old and New Testaments that prove the doctrine of the Trinity, that underscore its revelational basis, Van Til begins his doctrinal discussion under the heading Doctrinal Statement, chapter 17. So in light of the number of those biblical texts that teach the doctrine of the Trinity, the first sentence in the doctrinal statement in chapter 17 begins this way. On the basis of these and other scripture passages, 
The Westminster Confession, chapter 2, section 3, says, In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, two points need to be noted here about this starting point for the doctrinal statement in chapter 17 of IST. First, not only does Van Til affirm that the revelation of the Trinity lies at the heart of the Christian religion as revealed in Scripture, but he confesses a creedal and confessional doctrine of the Trinity. Van Til is not a biblicist aiming at novelty. He is not a philosophically driven theologian interested in innovation beyond creedal and confessional categories. His Trinitarian formulae enshrine the classical Reformed Trinitarianism represented in chapter 2, section 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Whatever Van Til seeks to develop, it is rooted in the scriptures as that scriptural teaching is summarily expressed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And second, and germane for our purpose tonight, Van Til begins his doctrinal statement of the Trinity with the Westminster Confession of Faith. He begins his doctrinal statement. He does not begin with a contemporary dogmatic theologian like Hermann Bavinck or Gerhardus Voss. He does not begin with an ancient or Reformation theologian such as Augustine or Calvin. Instead, he begins with the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Reformed Confession of his own Orthodox Presbyterian heritage. This illustrates that Van Til, as he presents his own theology of the Trinity, begins self-consciously with a Reformed symbol. He presents himself, first and foremost, as a confessionally Reformed Trinitarian theologian. However, it's not merely that Van Til begins with the Westminster Confession of Faith. Van Til tethers his understanding of the teaching of the Confession on the Trinity to its reception at Old Princeton, represented particularly by the work of A. A. Hodge in his commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Thus, Van Til does not simply present his own novel view of the interpretation of the confession. Rather, he takes a published work from an old Princeton theologian and relays it in capsule form and presents confessional theology as received by old Princeton as a theological institution. Van Til takes the work of Hodge in his commentary on the confession of faith and embraces it as his own. And he deems that discussion that Hodge has of the confession as very valuable as a summary of the teaching of the confession which encapsulates his own theology. Therefore, let us move on to understand the basic contours of the confession's doctrine of the Trinity as A. A. Hodge offers three foundational propositions that summarize the Trinitarian theology in the Westminster Standards. Van Til quotes directly these three summarizing propositions that outline the doctrine of the Trinity, and what I'm going to call it, for the sake of our lecture tonight, are the three structural strands that distinctly and conjointly represent confessional Trinitarian orthodoxy. And let me make explicit from the outset that keeping these distinct strands together at all times as mutually conditioning, mutually reinforcing propositions is as, as important as I know how to emphasize. It's not simply that each proposition is confessed and held in isolation from the others, but each proposition represents a fundamental truth about the Trinity that must always qualify the others and be understood in light of the others. 
And so it requires us to think in terms of the intertwining and interrelation of these three structural strands. In the section, chapter 17, entitled Doctrinal Statement, Van Til cites and quotes directly from Hodge these three mutually intertwined structural strands that form classically reformed Trinitarian theology. I'm going to read that for you. In explanation of this, A.A. Hodge says, Having before shown that there is but one living and true God, and that His essential properties embrace all perfections, this section on the Trinity asserts in addition, first, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are equally one God, and that the indivisible divine essence and all divine perfections and prerogatives belong each to each in the same sense and degree. Secondly, that these titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are not different names of the same person in different relations, but different persons. Third, that these three divine persons are distinguished from one another by certain personal properties and are revealed in a certain order of subsistence and operation. These, end of quote, these, according to Hodge, are the three conjointly integral aspects of a robust confessional theology of the Trinity. And so let me treat these propositions in order and let us look at the way Hodge expounds them as they represent Van Til's own view in terms of its confessional expression as received by Old Princeton, where Van Til was trained. First, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are each equally the one God, and in the indivisible divine essence, and all divine perfections and prerogatives belong to each in the same sense and degree. The point here is that while there are three persons in the Godhead, there is an indivisible divine essence that contains all of the divine perfections and prerogatives that are possessed by each person in the same sense and in the same degree. This means that the indivisible divine essence and all the perfections proper to that essence belong equally to the three persons who together are that essence. The Father is God without remainder. The Son is God without remainder. The Spirit is God without remainder. Each is God in the same sense and in the same degree. There are not levels of deity within the Godhead descending from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. To put this more directly, the divine essence is not something above, beyond, behind, or outside of each Trinitarian person. Rather, each person just is the entire and undivided divine essence. All the divine perfections and all the divine attributes belong to that essence, and belong to each person without remainder. One last way of putting it, each person is distinctly and exhaustively the entirety of the undivided essence of God. Now the implication that follows from this, according to Hodge, is this, quote, It follows that if the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost consist of the same numerical essence, they must have the same identical attributes in common, that is, there is common to them one intelligence and one will, etc. Now this needs to be explained. First, Hodge says there is one numerical essence critical language in terms of historic Orthodox Trinitarianism. By indivisible 
and numerical unity of the essence, Hodge affirms the divine simplicity and substantial unity of the Godhead. Each person possesses all of the undivided essence and all of the divine perfections without remainder. The Father is God without remainder, Son is God without remainder, Holy Spirit God without remainder, but there are not three gods. There is only one God with one essence, and He is numerically one. Now this is different from creatures who have a generic unity. For instance, there's a class of people, image bearers, who all have a human nature. It's a generic unity of separate individuals within the class of humanity. But human nature does not exhaust the identity of the creature. Since there are a number of accidental properties beyond human nature that distinguish humans in the class of humanity. Some are tall, some are short, some are smart, some are wise, some are wealthy, some are not. In the human being, there is more in the particular human being than there is in the essence of the human. So we are distinguished from one another in the class of humans, not by our natures, but by additional accidental properties added to our natures that distinguish us from one another. But the divine nature is not that way. The divine nature itself distinguishes God from all that is not God. God is not in a class like humans. He is sui generis, categorically distinct from all that is created and possessed of a single numerical unity and an indivisible divine nature. There is not one essence and three separate persons as you find with creatures who have a generic unity of essence. Rather, the divine nature exhausts the identity of God. The divine nature distinguishes God from all that is not God. God is identical to his one divine nature, and that nature cannot be multiplied in numerous instances like human nature. Nor is there something in addition to that essence or beyond that essence that further distinguishes God from creatures. God is distinguished from all that is not God by his undivided, uncreated essence, which is numerically one. This is foundational monotheism that's taught in the scriptures, confessed in the creeds, and expressed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinctly and without remainder that one divine nature and possess fully and equally all of the divine attributes. But, in addition, as an entailment of that numerical unity of essence, Hodge says that each person, quote, must have the same identical attributes in common, that is, there is, a co there is common to them one intelligence and one will. If God is numerically one, then he has one intelligence and one will, one self-conscious, self-determined existence as the one living and true God. God in his unity of essence is divided neither in his mind nor in his will. There are not three separate intelligences and three separate wills in the one living and true God. Hodge says in his Outlines of Theology, we cannot conceive of how three persons can have among them but one intelligence and one will. But this is precisely what the doctrine of God's numerical unity and divine simplicity entails. Neither the being, nor the knowledge, nor the will of God is divided or partitioned. God's being is numerically one. God's knowledge is numerically one. God's will is numerically one. 
But a question emerges at this point. How do we relate the three persons of the Trinity to the one undivided essence, to the one undivided intelligence, to the one undivided mind and will? That leads us to the second and third propositions that Hodge sets forth, which we will treat together, and you'll see why. Here they are. Second, speaking now of the persons of the Trinity, these titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are not different names of the same person in different relations, but different persons. Third, and expounding, these three divine persons are distinguished from one another by certain personal properties and are revealed in a certain order of subsistence and of operation. Now, what does that mean? Let me explain. The Trinitarian persons are not merely different names of the one divine person in different relations. They are different or distinct persons. How then do we understand them to be different or distinct persons if God is numerically one, possessed of one intelligence, one will, and one mind? Well, Hodge says first that the Trinitarian persons are distinguished by incommunicable personal properties that are not common to the three. That needs to be emphasized. Each person possesses an incommunicable personal property that is not common to the divine essence, that is not shared in the Trinity. The Father is unbegotten. The Son is begotten of the Father. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And these mark out incommunicable personal properties that cannot be interchanged. Paternity belongs to the Father alone. Filiation belongs to the Son alone. Spiration belongs to the Spirit alone. And these are the discriminating properties that differentiate the persons who are the one living and true God. These properties cannot be interchanged. This means there is a bona fide personal distinction within the undivided essence of God. Each person is distinguished from the other by a property not common to all three. This is one of the greatest difficulties in the doctrine of the Trinity. While confessing the undivided unity of the Godhead, and while confessing that each person is entirely that undivided essence, we also confess that there are three properties not common to the essence of God. Three, uh, pro pardon me, three properties that are not common to all persons, but rather unique to each, distinctive of each, discriminating personal properties. But what more can we say about those three in order to avoid, avoid the error of tritheism? How do we avoid risking some kind of separation of the persons within the divine essence if these are incommunicable personal properties that do not belong one to the other but distinguish one from the other? How can we avoid the specter of tritheism, of separating the persons from what unites. Well, Hodge adds something critical by way of explanation. This is fundamental to Reformed and uh, Catholic lowercase c orthodoxy. He says this, quote, the properties of each person, on the other hand, are those peculiar modes of personal subsistence which distinguish the relation of each to the others. You see, these personal properties are personal relations of subsistence among the persons of the Trinity. And these persons 
are equal in glory and power, the same in substance without remainder. So, let me put it this way. The Father, as unbegotten, is not the Son, but He subsists distinctly as the entire and undivided essence of God. The Son, as eternally begotten of the Father, is not the Father, but He subsists distinctly as the entire and undivided essence of God, and likewise the Holy Spirit. The personal properties are at the same time subsistent relations in the entire undivided essence of God. So while distinguished by these personal properties, each person subsists distinctly as the whole and undivided divine essence. No one person has more or less deity than the others. They are absolute and without qualification, co-equal, having the same substance, power, and glory. So this idea of a subsisting relation that Hodge talks about, this is what we affirm about the persons that keeps us from dividing or partitioning the essence of God. And the conception of a subsistent relation needs a brief word of explanation. For a Trinitarian person to subsist as the entire divine essence means simply that the person is related to the essence by way of identity. The Father is the essence of God. The Son is the essence of God. The Spirit is the essence of God so that each are exhaustively identical to the divine nature. The three persons, therefore, do not divide or partition the one essence of the Godhead. They subsist distinctly as it. So neither the undivided divine essence, the incommunicable personal properties, nor the peculiar modes of personal subsistence, none of those three are accidental or incidental to the life of God. They are equally basic, equally fundamental, and equally ultimate in God. This, in brief, is basic Trinitarian orthodoxy spelled out in a bit more detail than those three summarizing propositions. Now, all of this comes to expression, and this might start to sound a little bit more concrete as we move in this direction, when we realize that the order of subsistence is reflected in the order of operations. The order of operation might be a bit more concrete as we think about it. What does that bring into view? Well, when God relates to the world, he relates to that which is outside of himself. And while all the works of God outside of himself are the works of the one undivided Godhead, those same works have a personal terminus. The works of God in creation and redemption are the work of the one God, but there is a personal terminus in the work of the one God. This is illustrated most clearly, I believe, in the events of Incarnation and Pentecost. While the work of God in Incarnation is undivided, it is the Son and not the Father who is incarnate. The Son, not the Father or the Spirit, terminates in an act of hypostatic union, taking a true body and reasonable soul into union with His divine person. This is true only of the Son, even though He cannot be divided at any point from the Godhead or separated from the Father or the Spirit. Likewise at Pentecost, it is not the Father or the Son who is poured out from heaven, Acts 2, 22, uh, 32 through 33, but it is the person of the Holy Spirit. 
The Spirit's terminal work consists in uniting the church to the crucified and ascended Christ, and the Spirit, not the Father and not the Son, is poured out from heaven on the day of Pentecost. This is true only of the Spirit, even though He cannot be divided at any point from the Godhead or separated from the Father or the Son. Matching then the unique subsistent relations is a certain order of operation distinct to each person in the Godhead. Unity and diversity are equally ultimate features in the life of the Trinity. Now in evangelical theology, Hodge says that God, quote, exists eternally and constitutionally as three self-conscious persons. But for aught we know, in the depths of his infinite being, there may be a common consciousness which includes the whole Godhead and a common personality. That may be true, but what belongs with us to deal with is the sure and obvious fact of revelation that God exists from eternity as three self-conscious persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now here's what I want you to note. And the reason I'm treating Hodge so much is that after I've treated him, all I need to do is read Van Til to you. So it'll, it'll get easier here in a second. But, but I just, I just want, want to do this. It, it, it's going to pay off, I promise. Hodge, aware of the mystery involved, ventures to say that a common intelligence and a common will implies a common consciousness and a common personality that characterizes the divine unity and the divine simplicity. A common knowledge, a common will, a common consciousness, and a common personality are the entailments of the numerical unity and divine simplicity of God. Yet, at the same time, there are three distinct subsisting relations within that self-sufficient, self-determined being, three distinct self-conscious persons. So, while there are three distinct, incommunicable personal properties, three distinct modes of personal dis subsistence, and three distinct self-conscious persons, this does not suggest three separate centers of self-consciousness in the Godhead. Trinitarian persons are not individuals who are separate or independent of one another as are human persons. They don't have a generic unity, they have a specific numerical unity. Self-conscious Trinitarian persons subsist in the one essence of God and cannot have independent self-consciousness. That would be a denial of simplicity, and it would move inevitably in the direction of tritheism. Thus, there is a one consciousness that Hodge confesses due to the undivided numerical unity of the Godhead. And there is a three consciousness that Hodge confesses due to the three subsisting relations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are the one God. And Hodge says that this must ever continue to us as a profound mystery as it transcends all analogy. In his Outlines of Theology, just outside of his confessional work, he says, we cannot conceive of three persons having but one intelligence and one will. Yet, it is equally necessary to say that not only does God have one mind and one intelligence, but exists from eternity as three self-conscious persons. In old Princeton's reception of confessional Trinitarian theology, the numerical unity of God entails there is one absolute consciousness, one absolute personality. Language Bovink is going to use. We'll look at him here in a second. Yet at the same time, that theology insists 
that in the subsistent relations, you find three self-conscious persons in the same Godhead. God is one conscious and three conscious, and that transcends all analogy. This moves the church to confess robustly the divine incomprehensibility of God and to worship and adore the one who is one in three, three in one, the absolute tripersonal God. Now, this is not yet Van Til. This, this is what Van Til quotes and presupposes that those who read him understand. And he not only quotes the three summarizing propositions, but he turns us to this section that I've just exegeted and says the whole section is very valuable for our understanding. Now, here's what I want you to appreciate as we continue to move forward. I'm about to give you a break. Come up for air. In this presentation, what you have is not a novel, speculative, philosophical attempt at Trinitarian theology. This is an exposition of the three structural strands that chart the nature of the triune God as revealed in Westminster Confession 2.3. And those three basic points are the unity, the numerical unity of the divine essence and the divine simplicity, the fact there are three distinct persons with three incommunicable personal properties who are that essence, and the additional insight that not only are they three distinct persons with incommunicable personal properties, but each subsists entirely as that one undivided essence of God, moving us to speak of God as absolute personality in his unity and tripersonal in his diversity. And what we'll do after the break is I'll give you a shorter exposition of Bavink who says the same thing from a different point of view. And um, then we'll move into Van Til. And I want to give you the, the idea of the thesis that I'm starting to develop. If you want to understand Van Til's Trinitarian theology, what I think he represents is the crossroads of old Princeton and old Amsterdam's Trinitarian orthodoxy set forth and advanced in a constructive and fruitful direction aimed at post-enlightenment species of unbelief in the expression of modern theology and modern philosophy. And so after this break, we'll look not simply at the English Puritan confessional influence on Van Til, but the continental Dutch tradition mediated through Bavink. And what we'll begin to appreciate is that Van Til is encompassing both of these traditions and integrating them as he moves Trinitarian theology forward in the 20th century. And hopefully, we can come to appreciate that and seek to do the same. So I'll give you a, a five or 10 minute break. And is, is it question time yet? Yeah, I'll just tell you, we'll do questions. One of my favorite things is question and answer time. So. Um, I'll try to save time so that when we finish, uh, we'll have about 15 minutes. But take about a five or 10 minute break, and then we'll swing back, and I'll go for about 45 more minutes and then wrap it up.